So welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Faisal Shanib and just to introduce myself quickly, I, I work at Concordia University as the Environmental Specialist in Facilities Management. I'm also a researcher in uh, circular economy and digitization here at Concordia University as a PhD student. So um, I help to oversee our zero waste programming with some of the folks who are here today. Uh, and I've been working here for a long time and very excited to have the group here in person and virtually join us. So uh, I'm going to start off with a territorial acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Ganyangahaga Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Jojage, or Montreal as we often know it, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other people. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with the indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. And uh, I'm gonna follow suite with something Arian has pointed out before, just a personal sort of perspective on, on that note is we further recognize that in relation to today's topic on single use plastics, that this same unceded land is used for resource extraction and disposal with or without the consent of First Nations people and that we have a responsibility to consume and waste better, to care for and sustain this land for future generations. So welcome all to our closing event. Uh, of the zero waste week, which happened last week, <laughs> but you know this we couldn't find a conference room last week, so we're having it this week. Uh, it was also the zero waste challenge, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that means in a second. And uh, we're also having this panel discussion on single use plastic bans, a very uh, of the moment topic and a very important topic, and one that connects to you know the challenge you all did and and you know the zero waste week we had. So. Uh, just one more reminder, we do have a banquet of food for those of you who just arrived, please help yourselves at any moment. We don't have any particular schedule of when you should and shouldn't eat. So go ahead and help yourselves. Uh, it's vegan from the hive, which is a cooperative student run uh, cafe here in uh, Concordia University. Sorry? <laughs> because we ate at the hive before. Yeah, <laughs> some of you may have just eaten there. I know. So we should have warned you. You can, yeah, you don't have to eat it twice. Um, <clears throat> so thanks again for joining us. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the thing we're doing today is showing our appreciation for those of you who did participate in the Zero Waste Challenge. And um, that was a sort of different incarnation of our Zero Waste Weekend Challenge than we've ever done. It's, I think, the first time we've done it back on campus in person uh, with a zero waste commitment from the institution. So mm -hmm. I was uh, recalling with Arian, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we first, you know, caught wind of the zero waste movement and decided to give it a shot, this challenge idea ourselves. And we did a version of it a long time ago, but at the time it was very informal. You know, we were working out of student offices and uh, this is different now. We, you know, we have an institutional level commitment that goes all the way up to our board of governors and, and presidents. And uh, we have a team, you know, who, who are paid to work on these services and initiatives. And we wanted to really encourage our community to get to know this, this action we've committed to and to get to know the, uh, the services and initiatives we did. So that's why we came up with this bingo card idea in which, you know, your actions uh, give you points to get these prizes. So we're going to do the draw for that later. Um, but, you know, those of you who participated, you went to an e-waste reuse uh, workshop, for example, or you came and visited the, the Center for Creative Reuse. Um, you know, maybe you went to the Precious Plastics uh, introductory event and got to know the team and maybe volunteered for a position and, you know, learned how their process works. So we're, we're really doing some really neat stuff here. And we're, we're happy to see everybody participating and uh, excited to hear from you also how it went. You know, we want to know what you thought about the week, the challenge, as a person, as a community, however you framed it. Uh, so the emphasis was a little bit less on the, the challenge as an individual part this year. You know, we, we're trying to evolve from that concept. And sort of that's why we tagged on this, this panel event as well, to connect with the political level of action that's happening from Montreal to Canada. And it's actually happening around the world. I, I caught wind that Dubai is enacting a single use plastic ban in the coming years as well. Um, and so there are other cities as well. 
Uh, and, you know, I'd say this year's challenge also in terms of numbers, uh, you know, I don't know how many people actually did it in the end, but we had over 100 registrations. So that's definitely a record for us. That's not bad for our, for our community. And so we hope that this movement continues to grow and that you all find ways to continue to participate in the future. I also want to take a minute to just thank our team who put together this event. Uh, whether it was Maya who really threaded together all of the pieces and did a lot of our design work. I believe she may be outside or may have already left. Or Arian, who is our sustainability technician and, and did a lot of the, the groundwork for us. Uh, Mava also helped with all of our online promotions. Uh, you know, obviously we can't, we can't do it without an amazing team. So thank you very much, really appreciate it. So um, without further ado, I'd like to um, introduce our panelists very quickly and then ask uh, if Rebecca in particular would, would give us her presentation. Uh, so I'll start with the panelists who are here with us in person. Uh, we've got Arian Weeks, who I mentioned is part of our, our team uh, in the zero waste team at facilities management, a sustainability technician. Uh, we have a Marina who is uh, one of our precious plastics team members. And uh, virtually we have attendance from Rebecca Gouge who is coming from Environment and Climate Change Canada. We've got Calvin Lacan from York University who is a waste researcher. And uh, we have Maud Filion who is coming from the city of Montreal. So welcome to all of you and I'll, I'll let you do more in depth uh, introductions in a minute, but um, Rebecca, if you uh, if you'd be so kind to give us your your introductory presentation, I think that would be a great way to start the conversation, get some context for all of us. So welcome. Perfect. Thank you for the introduction. So yeah, my name is Rebecca Gouge. I'm a compliance promotion officer at Environmental and Climate Change Canada. I will share my screen. Um, Okay. Can you all see it? Yes, perfect. Okay. So, just a quick five minutes with motivation and overview of the regulation. Um, so, in October 2020, the Government of Canada released a science assessment of plastic pollution. The science assessment found that plastic is polluting our rivers, lakes, and oceans, arming wildlife, and generating microplastics in the water that we use and that we drink. It recommends that the government pursue actions to reduce the amount of microplastics and microplastics um, that end up in the environment in accordance with the precautionary principle. Well, that's the first uh, document on the left. Also in October 2020, ECCC released a discussion paper entitled A Proposed Integrated Management Approach to Plastic Products to Prevent Waste and Pollution. For a public consultation period that closed on December 9, 2020, uh, feedback received was considered in developing regulations to ban or restrict certain single-use plastic. So in that second document, um, this, the discussion paper, it also contained the management framework for um, SUPS. So SUPS acronym is single use plastic. We use it a lot, so uh, you might see again that uh, acronym. So this document provide a transparent and evidence-based approach to determining how to manage risk uh, to the environment posed by single use plastic. Uh, to determine if a single-use plastic product should be banned, the framework consider whether the item is relevant in the environment and whether it poses a treat of harm to wildlife in their habitats. It also considers whether um, the item is difficult to recycle and if it has an uh, easily available alternative. So the government used this framework to identify the six categories of single-use plastic item targeted by the single-use plastic prohibition regulations, which were uh, published in the Canada Gazette Part 2 in June 2022. So overview of the regulation, the single-use plastic prohibition regulation published in June 2022 are part of the Government of Canada's comprehensive plan to reduce plastic pollution and move towards a zero plastic waste future. The purpose uh, is to prevent plastic pollution by eliminating or restricting six categories of single-use plastic, so SUPS, 
um, that pose a threat to the environment, are difficult to recycle, or have alternative. The targets, uh, the regulation prohibit the manufacture, import, and sale of single-use plastic, so including the six category, uh, checkout bag, cutlery, food service were made from or containing problematic plastic, ring carriers, stir stick, and straw, with some exception for single-use plastic flexible straws. Well, that was very quick. <laughs> Uh, if you want to have more detail on the regulation, the first uh, URL at the top, canada.ca slash single-use plastic ban, you have access to the technical guidelines that covers the regulation in detail, give example of what's banned or not, uh, guidance for selecting alternative, um, also the three documents I quickly presented. So uh, don't hesitate to reach out also if you have questions that are a bit more complex or that I'm not able to cover today. That was wonderful. Thank you. Perfect summary. Uh, so um, I also want to just kind of reinforce Rebecca's point. Like if you want more information on this ban or even the citywide ban, the, the websites that they've created for both of these are very informative and comprehensive and clear. So check them out. Uh, but yes, so now we'll, we'll jump into sort of the panel discussion part. So as an introductory, uh, an opportunity to introduce yourselves a little bit, I'll ask you to, to, you know, just introduce who you are, you know, what you do, and uh, what was your motivation in joining us today? Uh, you know, what's the reason that you're here and what you're hoping to accomplish? So uh, maybe we'll start with um, Ariane Weeks here in the room, and uh, we'll go to Marina after, and we'll go to the virtual guests after. Thank you, Faisal. So you mentioned earlier that I'm the sustainability technician here uh, in facilities management at Concordia University. Um, it's kind of a broad term, but uh, basically every single day I walk around most of the time the university and look and see uh, what materials are we throwing out that we can continue to use on campus. Um, so I'm one of the co-founders of the Center for Creative Reuse here. Uh, where we uh, gather reusable materials um, from across campus and put them in a sort of free store uh, space and give them back to the community uh, free of charge. Um, but in all of those adventures around campus, I come across a lot of single-use plastics, maybe not necessarily the ones that we just saw on the screen, but uh, a lot of other types, uh, styrofoam probably being the biggest one. And uh, as a consumer, plastic is is one of my sort of the biggest pains of my existence is trying to figure out what to do uh, with the plastic, uh, getting to that moment right before the recycling bin and be like, well, does can I actually put this in there? And if I put it in there, will it actually be recycled? So um, that's why I'm, uh, I've joined this panel today is get a better understanding from uh, at the municipal and, and federal levels. Um, what we're doing to help our communities uh, reduce the plastic that we use um, with the hopes of what Rebecca just said, a zero, zero waste uh, plastic future for Canada. All right, so as Faisal said, um, I'm Marina, I'm part of CP3, which is the Concordia Precious Plastics. Um, the project Precious Plastics exists um, almost in many places nowadays, there is a, a Precious Plastics Montreal, but ours is the Concordia chapter. We recycle plastic on campus at the Grey Nuns building. Um, we're neighbors to soccer. Um, we, um, we have our own little facility where we recycle PLA and PET. Um, it's kind of a fun process. If anyone is uh, wants to learn a new skill, learn how to recycle, um, I am a mentor at CP3. Um, we do presentations as well. We have educational content um, on Instagram, and we also go to schools and or any initiatives that would like to have a presentation. Um, well, I feel like my presence here is kind of <laughs> um, because I I'm a part of CP3, and I'm the organization I'm a part of is specifically targeting plastic waste, right? We are taking plastic waste from Concordia and from the community and directly um, 
recycling it. I'm very sad that I forgot my earrings today because at CP3, we are actually, uh, we, we sell our earrings. We have earrings, we have keychains, and you can see the process that we have and it exists. We're actually taking plastic and recycling it on campus as students, and that's really fun. Um, I guess that's all I had to say. Yeah, we have a, a sample of some of the CV3 material here before we go into the next guest. So here are some okay. plant pots made sorry. of. Sorry yeah. for those online. These are some of the plant pots that are made from uh, recycled plastics on campus. You know, yeah, the, these are the flower pots. Um, it all started with the Sustainability Ambassadors uh, program that someone had a plan to recycle and to make flower pots. Um, Oh, and the coasters, thank you so much. We also have coasters, as you can see, recycled plastic. They, they never look the same, so each of them are unique. Um, so this is also really fun because we get to do our own patterns and we never know what's going to come out of it um, because when it melts, it's going to melt the way it wants in a way. Um, but yeah, these are, these are two different processes. Um, but... I am the political science student at CP3, not the engineer. So <laughs> you guys can check it out how, uh, how this is different in a more technical way um, if you reach out to us. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, good job at the samples. I think that was a good call. Yeah, thank so you. Uh, we'll move on to our virtual guests. Uh, maybe we'll start with Maud. If you'd like to uh, introduce yourself. I'm sorry. Maud. Yeah, no I'm problem. sorry. I was looking for that. No <laughs> uh, well, hi, everyone. I'm happy to be here today. I'm uh, Maud Fillion, uh, Waste Management Planning Manager uh, for the City of Montreal. Uh, so my team is responsible of uh, planning of the city, the planning of the city services uh, by contract for the collection, transport uh, and treatment of residual material. Also, the implementation of the city master plan, uh, 2020-2025, uh, 20, uh, 20, which includes uh, 49 uh, broader actions to improve the performance of the city. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I'm really happy to join this discussion with the uh, actors of change, as we see, <laughs> with a field experience. Uh, I think uh, you may have uh, many, well, your work may uh, raise many questions on how C uh, works. Uh, I hope I can answer most of them, <laughs> but uh, you'll probably see we still have many questions ourselves on how to improve the system. So it's uh, it's really um, interesting to work with uh, with everybody to find these solutions. So I'm happy to be with you today. Thanks for the invitation. No, really, it's uh, our pleasure. We're really grateful that you joined us. Thank you, Mo. Uh, Calvin, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, and I apologize in advance if you're a barking dog in the background. It's nice weather, so he's like going in and out of the house. Um, so I'm Dr. Calvin Lackin, and I'm from York University in the Faculty of Environment and Urban Change, and I'm co-director of something called the Waste Wiki Project, which is Canada's largest research initiative devoted to waste. And I'm here today because I'm actually not an opponent of single-use plastics. I'm glad I'm participating virtually so people can't throw food at me. <laughs> um, and a lot of my research explores uh, the role of single-use plastics in a uh, circular economy and in terms of promoting sustainability and kind of looking at more of the systemic issues that lead to our reliance on single-use plastics to begin with. Uh, so it's a pleasure to join all of you today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. And Rebecca? Yeah, hi everyone. So thank you for the invitation, Fizal. Uh, I am a compliance to promotion officer and obviously uh, discussing about the regulation and further uh, coming uh, ban. And yeah, the Canadian effort and trying to answer all your question about that. And thank you for all the effort. And I think the plant um, uh, plot, the plant pot and all what you're doing at Concordia is very great. It's awesome. Wonderful, thank you. Okay. Well, so we, we really tried to get a good uh, mix of, of voices and perspectives, and so we're, we're grateful to see you all here today. So we're going to jump into some questions we have prepared, and uh, also uh, we'll jump into audience questions later as well. And uh, for the panelists, if you have questions for each other, I mean, don't be shy. This is meant to be a, a discussion and a, really an opportunity to connect, so... All right, I'll start off with uh, just, you know, the context, you know, we got the, the um, presentation from Rebecca about the, the federal prohibition and what it means and where it's applying. 
And um, you know, I've noticed that the the single use plan in, in Montreal is similar, but obviously happening at a different scale. It seems to target food service wear primarily. Uh, so, what, just wanted to ask, uh, what are some of the the kind of differences in the approaches uh, between the the different bands? And uh, if the panel could offer any insight onto why they are framed differently, or or what's kind of similar, and and what the intended impacts are. And so, we'll we'll open it up to whoever to answer. Um, maybe I can start. Um, well, as we just saw, for, I'm sorry for my English in advance. <laughs> I'll try to do my best here. Um, actually, uh, the difference, the main difference, I think, into the two regulations will be um, mainly, they're, they're mostly similar. They're very similar. But it will be the target for the federal will be um, also on the fabrication and importation, as Montreal will apply only for restaurant and food stores. So we go where we can go <laughs> with uh, our abilities in regulation. Um, for uh, for the, the articles, um, we have added up the cups also for drinking. So the cups for drinking are uh, targeted in our uh, reglementation, um, recycling symbol from one to seven, mostly because our city is uh, responsible of the end of life of the materials. And this is one of uh, the biggest um, quantity we can see in the uh, outdoor uh, waste management. So on streets, parks, this is uh, one of the, the principal item we find. And uh, with the difficulty of sorting for people, uh, it appeared to us a major um, element to target. So this would be uh, mainly this, uh, the, the, the difference, I think. Wonderful. Any other, uh, I don't know, any other insight, Rebecca, or are you? Yeah, yeah, I can uh, jump on that. So the federal single use plastic prohibition regulation applies across Canada and provides like a, a base level um, for, for whole, all province and territorial. Uh, the federal prohibition also prevent items from entering and exiting Canada's border, which is a bit um, different with municipalities to have power. And so like Montreal can adopt requirements with regard of the single use plastic uh, item. And the federal reg put like a base and then municipality can, can be more strict. Mm. So they almost seem to work in consultation almost in a way. Um, okay, so I sort of tagged on to my question, but I think, uh, I think I'm gonna bring it back up. It's really about the intended impacts of these, these uh, interventions, right? So we, we saw in Rebecca's presentation, you know, the science that went behind uh, you know, the justification about marine pollution. And so obviously there's an intended uh, effect of maybe reducing some of that uh, marine pollution or reducing the total amount of waste and of unnecessary waste is something we added to our title as well, right? So it's about unnecessary single use plastics. Uh, so if I've seen some figures on the federal website, but I, I was just wondering if the panel could maybe speak to the, um, you know, how how these estimates are made, if they if they exist at the different scales, uh, you know, where, where the impacts are intending to happen, what we can expect to see, and maybe how, how this is gonna be measured. Yeah, I can start. So, or some, some, no, <laughs> go ahead, somebody else if there's a, sorry, I'm just jumping. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, but in positive outcomes of, uh, of our ban, um, we expect a net decrease of approximately 1.3 million tons in plastic waste over the 10 years. So from 2023 to 2032, uh, which was on around 3% of total estimate plastic waste generated in Canada each year. Um, they're also uh, ex ex expected to uh, result in decrease of around 22,000 tons in plastic pollution over the same period, which represent around 5% of the total plastic pollution gen generated e each year. Uh, we have a question from the office, specifically in Canada, right? Is that is what we're talking about? Just to clarify. Great. Uh, for Montreal, this reglementation would uh, um, be estimated to uh, 10,000 uh, tons of uh, material that goes mainly to waste uh, to uh, elimination for the moment. So um, this is uh, an impact on uh, our financial 
uh, aspect, well, the finance of, of, of the municipality um, and also on the performance. But uh, mostly, I think it, it was also to, um, um, to um, reflect the desire of the population, the citizens, uh, to be more um, in, uh, in adequate uh, adequation with the principle of the city, which is uh, going to uh, a circular economy. And this regulation is really to put forward uh, the, um, the habit of going with the reusable items mostly. And uh, this is where the city wants to go. And I think there's a lot to do in this field. Um, so it's really, um, I think most in this in this way we're going for the regulation. Otherwise, the, the the quantity is not as important as as the scale of Canada, um, but still. Yeah, we have a so kind of uh, related to what both you, Rebecca, and and Motor are talking about is how how are we helping whether a municipality or uh, institutions across the country. Uh, get there because we've we've seen the change or very recently we had an ice storm here last week uh, I was without power on Thursday or was it yeah Thursday morning had to get some breakfast so went out to a local cafe that somehow still had power um, and saw the change happen uh, on my way there I was oh no I'm going to end up with a coffee cup that's going to have a plastic lid on it I don't want to do that. It's zero waste week. But when I arrived, I was happy to see that the one of the owners was holding a, a paper cup with a paper lid on it. And in having a brief discussion with this, this person, discovered that it was sort of the fifth uh, lid that they had tested because they had to go through several lids to figure out one that sealed properly, that you know drank, you know, people could drink their coffee um, easily. Um, and that was the onus was on the business to do that mm -hmm. testing, right? So I'm wondering what kind of support programs are in place because in Montreal the ban just came into effect um, on the 28th of March. Um, what kinds of of uh, support programs do we have uh, federally and municipally uh, to help businesses? Because uh, it's it's a cost difference, right? There, there's a significant cost difference as well to making the changeover. So I'm, I'm curious uh, what, what you might have to say. Yeah, uh, actually we have made economic impact studies um, before the regulation and it has shown that there were alternatives for the lid also. Uh, we're aware that uh, they may not have all the sizes or the uh, options, uh, the the uh, commerce and the, the people look for uh, for the moment. So the the provisionment, the approvisionment, the approvisionment uh, is still, I think, a limit for certain people. But uh, but there is solutions. It was important for us before to go there to confirm this. And we speak a lot with the distributors. Uh, I know they look for new solutions. Uh, what's important to say also is um, since the 28th of uh, March, the regulation is applied. Our inspectors that go through the city um, make their inspection, but they don't apply penalties for the moment. Of course, they identify the problems, uh, they help to find the solutions, um, and they, they work with the, the commercial to find their, uh, their way through this. We also financed uh, some uh, many programs of, um, to accompany, to, yeah, to help um, business people. Uh, we have also, uh, as the uh, Guta, Guichet Unique, a unique Guichet. Uh, I don't know how do you say this, Le Guichet Unique. So it's uh, one organism that uh, shows um, what, what all the alternatives. They can also go in the uh, business to identify the, pro identify the problem and help to find solutions. So this is the kind of program we help to, um, to have support for the businesses in their solution. And we have also a consultation table for the reusable um, materials. 
and this uh, there are about 10 companies uh, that works with different solutions for events summer events outside also for restoration uh, so they um, multiple they, they multiply their offer also for this uh, kind of uh, customers but we know that all solutions are not there yet <laughs> yes just as a really quick anecdote. So first and foremost, I think it's important to recognize that um, it's, this is such a critical first step and that it's amazing that businesses and consumers are getting support and you know, uh, fostering awareness about what alternatives or options are available. But um, in conversations I've had with some stakeholders, the alternatives, so for example, compostable packaging, there's still so much confusion around you know, whether it's, it has the ability to substitute for some of these plastics, what options are available primarily to the restaurant sector, some of the regulations surrounding uh, whether a compostable package met the threshold of whether it could be used or whether it was single use um, was completely inconsistent with the nature of compostable packaging and how it's managed and its durability end of life. And so I think um, we've done a wonderful job of taking that first step, but in terms of enabling and empowering uh, stakeholders to understand their full spectrum of alternatives and what the trade-offs between those alternatives are, uh, there's still a little bit more work needs to be done. And that's just primarily an awareness issue. Yeah, great point. Okay, so sort of uh, to kind of take that point and run with it a little bit more, we're, I'd like to ask what what you all think is necessary for these bands to be effective. So we talked about awareness and support, and, and there definitely can be more of that. Uh, and we've heard a little bit about the enforcement that's starting, but it's not it's not being applied. It's more just inspecting. So I think people are wondering, you know, what level of, of enforcement is going to be happening or support. You know, there's so many people out there who are affected by this. How do you how do you really help them all or, you know, or find them all, uh, you know, if they if they need to be found? And um, are there other complementary approaches that are needed? Right. So beyond just the, the single use ban. What is sort of the alternative? So Marina is keen to answer this question. I'll let her start. I kind of wanted to 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 um, complement your question and ask if we're going to have also yearly reports on this. So are we are we seeing the results um, that we want, and is it going to be um, for the public? So we know if awareness is working, right? I think the CP3. Um, approach is very into awareness and into doing it ourselves um but then we can access it we we are a small team but then how does that happen within the municipality and within the federal government specifically because um canada the provinces are so different in how they see uh politics and how they see environmental issues so how are we going to know this on top, like what is working? Is it actually working? Are we going to have reports every year? Let me hear it. A lot of good uh, question. Maybe I can add a bit for the for the federal part. Uh, so of course, um, the regarding like lessons learned, the regulation has just begun. Uh, it's going to be a year uh, in June. So for us, we're monitoring uh, Canadian letter data and other source of information. And of course, um, summary will be shared through the Canada.ca. Um, and the government is always working with partners and stakeholders to identify area for further action. And as a sense of enforcement, just in regard with um, the federal, so the regulations are made under the Canadian Environmental Protection Act of uh, 1999, um, also called CEPA. So enforcement officer will, uh, when verifying, verifying compliance with the regulation, act in accordance uh, with the compliance and enforcement policy for SIPA. And ver verification of compliance um, with the regulation could include like site visit, review record, product testing, um, if applicable, and review of written and transit documents. Um, and yeah, like we said, there's a lot of compliance um, promotion effort that, that are put. Uh, we have different target date also for the further year. Um, so as we move toward to coming into force of the prohibition for sale uh, in December 23, so uh, business now cannot import um, the single use plastic that are banned, but they can still use their inventory up to uh, December 23. 
So we put a lot of effort in those uh, activity now uh, toward a wider audience because that's include it's can include restaurant, retailer, a Canadian uh, consumer also. Um, so we're very interested in working with environmental non uh, non governmental sorry <laughs> organization to promote our message and try to reach a larger audience. I, I just wanted to quickly add, historically comprehensive data collection at a national level is enormously difficult to do. In fact, for even something like printed paper and packaging, which we consider the shining star of the residential recycling system, there is no national database. If anything, we actually even have a patchwork of data collection at the provincial level. So I think that in the intervening period, uh, municipalities will actually kind of have to champion that role, whether fairly or unfairly, because it's a tremendous resource burden onto them but to gather and collect this data to actually implement, you know, awareness strategies and then gauge whether consumers or businesses are responding. I think that would have to be coordinated at a much more local level. And at best what the national uh, government can do is help support that type of research and data gathering. But the idea that there'll be annual reports going to a central data repository is, uh, is a wish more so than a reality, at least based on historical evidence. I mean, I, I work very closely with Faisal on waste in general at the university, and I know that we we collect that kind of data as an institution. So knowing how much how many tons of compost we're we're putting out and recycling and uh, landfill waste and so on, um, I know it's probably as you said, uh, it's a it's a huge undertaking to scale that up uh, even to the municipal level. But I I would hope that that we could in some way. Uh, because the numbers are really what's going to tell us uh, whether or not we're being effective. Um, and I want to come back to sort of the beginning of, of what Faisal asked uh, earlier is it, it comes down to awareness is um, at the municipal, at the federal, is what are, what are the programs in place? What are the support structures in place that bus particularly businesses have to make the change? Uh, but also, what do they do after December 20? 23rd this, this year or December of this year mm -hmm. when they still have a stack of styrofoam clamshell containers and they're scared about getting fined when the inspector comes on you know uh, in January on January 1st mm -hmm. so you know we're, we're starting to see uh, here particularly in Montreal uh, businesses either on the island or, or off that are uh, recycling uh, particularly styrofoam um, into into new plastics, which is a whole other discussion. But um, there, there's the technology exists. So I'm wondering, how are we educating businesses, particularly in the restaurant industry, that there's those options available to them? If they're scared about fines and so on, well, you know, maybe companies that are doing this kind of uh, recycling are, are able to support them as well uh, in in that changeover. Uh, in that shift. We have a question from the audience. Do you want to use the microphone or do you want to just ask us and we'll repeat it? Okay. Um, do you know what's the rate uh, for, for the uh, uh, recycled material that uh, goes to a uh, sorting station or uh, and specifically gets recycled? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, our total diversion rate right now is probably around 40%, but we haven't checked this year yet. Um, and then what happens at the sorting facility, I think is traditionally a black box question. We can't actually get the figures back from them. It's, it's, it's pretty much impossible to determine because it all gets mixed together with uh, other people's waste. Um, so I think we can follow up with more detailed chats on like how we do our reporting and stuff because it sounds like you're interested and we can, yeah, yeah, I would love to chat more about that. Okay, yeah, the city of Montreal uh, recycling figures, I guess there's a question on how much we recycle in total. Uh, but do you want to answer that question first or is there a follow-up? No, no, you don't want to answer it. No, oh. I like this company, I think it has options for like, um, what really happens when I bring my like, my Oh, okay, okay. So there, there's a question on whether recycling that goes in the bin actually gets recycled in the city of Montreal. Uh, so I don't know, Mode, if you would like to, to field those two questions. Yeah, uh, well, I just heard this one. Um, yeah. For the city of Montreal, there have been uh, a lot of uh, 
uh, uh, news and newspaper about this, I think, uh, we did have uh, some problem with the, just the management of the two uh, center that we own. Um, uh, the last year has uh, made some big changes in this uh, uh, dossier. And uh, so we have a new uh, organism responsible of these operations. Uh, the change uh, on the performance is uh, it's significant. I don't have the recent number, uh, but I think it has uh, decreased from 50% of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 um, total. It, yeah, of the total. So uh, the, uh, the performance is way better in this way. Uh, it doesn't change what comes in, by the way. So there's still a lot of review because, uh, People put sometimes everything. <laughs> you, you could see, you should see what we uh, we have, what we receive at the center. Sometimes it's really amazing. So there, there's still some um, um, a, a good part that has to go to elimination because it's not recycling at all. But if we look for only the performance of the center, these operations are much more uh, performant now, and um, the equipment in place has also upgraded. The, the last year. So I think it's a, a good, um, a good um, new uh, to promote. I think we should talk more about it. Um, there were uh, some uh, visit uh, lately, I think, for a newspaper, a newspaper at the center, so they can show a little bit uh, what, what's new in there. Uh, but uh, you may uh, learn more in, in the next year, uh, next uh, weeks. Mm. Wonderful. And we can also organize a visit to our local sorting recycling facility. I think people here would be interested in that. Uh, um, yes. I'm, Actually, yeah. you can ask for the center and they can uh, allow you to visit them. Yeah, that'll be a good group group uh, outing. Um, yeah, just to if come back to the health point. Yeah, or yeah, go ahead. Have two really quick comments. One is that, you know, every municipality struggles with contamination and low diversion rates at their facility. Yeah. I don't want anybody to ever think, that, you know, Montreal is somehow doing worse. Montreal is probably doing a much better job than most other major urban municipalities. Uh, in fact, I just did a tour of several uh, American mega MERFs and the contamination rates are in excess of 30%. That's more of an aside. My, my actual comment was the Canadian Standards Association is actually developing a comprehensive guideline for how do we actually measure recycling and diversion once it gets to a MRF and once it goes downstream. And so they're developing an accounting methodology so we can actually figure out, well, what really is our diversion rate? Right now, we just use marketed tons. Uh, so know that there is coordinated effort at, an, at, at the national level to provide that level of guidance in the future. Awesome. That's really good insight. Okay, thank you. Uh, I did just want to tie back your comment from earlier, Cal, that I appreciated, which is that, you know, the scale of the efforts are enormous and obviously local actors, you know, any way that governments can support local actors in, in helping to implement these things is, is greatly appreciated. And I think that kind of coordination, although challenging, would maybe help uh, with the success. So, you know, here, even at Concordia, not a huge scale, but we do have tenants, uh, commercial tenants, and we you know we're reaching out to them to make sure they're aware and know what's coming and, and asking them what kind of help they need. Um, so, you know, we're taking our own action, but I, I can imagine if that is replicated, uh, that would help this go better. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, what are, what are some of the lessons that were learned from single use plastic bands? Because that's sort of in my mind, like chapter one of what we're doing here. Uh, and, you know, I think that conversation had some fair criticisms about, you know, how it works, whether it works. Um, and, you know, what are some of the failings of, of just implementing that kind of a ban? So I wanted to know, uh, you know, what the panel thought about lessons learned from single-use plastic bag bans and whether they apply in this context. Um, if I could speak, I, and I think this is not an issue only with plastic, but in environmental issues in general, is that we tend to want to tackle the issue, one issue without looking at, in a holistic way. And so some issues with the plastic uh, ban, not only in Montreal, not only in Canada, it's all over the world, is that <laughs> the amount of tote bags that we have now, the amount of uh, the big, uh, still plastic, but not single-use plastic waste that we have in our homes. And um, you spoke a little bit about the lack of support for business. I, 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 I won't touch on that, but that can be a potential problem. And um, especially small businesses, right? Like there is a difference between a maxi and a, and a depanar. Um, and 
if we don't see the things in a holistic way with the with the the thinking that using paper thinking that using compostable material is gonna it's gonna solve our issues with waste it's it's reductive and naive we we need to think of different approaches of consumption we need to get at the base of everything and i think when we were talking earlier the issue of awareness we really need to tackle the youth and okay so we're not gonna have plastics anymore um but then do we have the capacity to compost and recycle paper bags and um paper straws and everything or are we creating another problem because i feel like with climate change, um, we have done that a lot of creating something new, right? Electric cars, I guess. <laughs> we know that, is that gonna be a solution? We don't know because um, electric cars <laughs> comes from mining um, and then you can't recycle the battery. So we need to think of a holistic approach. We need to think of consumption because it is exaggerated. Um, we we need to reevaluate our values as a society and that was deep but <laughs> that was kind of yeah appreciate it i don't even know what to say after that. <laughs> i don't know any any comments in response to that or well maybe i can add like yeah. for for us for less and learn the regulation is brand new so we're still <laughs> looking into that but beyond um like was just discussed there's challenge with moving toward a circular economy for plastic um and just to mention um the federal ban include plant-based plastic so plastic that are made from unconventional plastic that are part of um are also covered uh, so uh, as part of the government of Canada's plan to move forward for zero plastic waste, ECCC is developing regulation with recycled content and recyc uh, recyclability and compostability labeling requirements. So there is pre-consultation on the recycled content that are um, enabling that are taking place um, in the the work that took place in 2022 sorry and the target is for uh first propos proposition for the regulation to be published in fall 2023 followed by a public comment period and then the regulation would require that certain plastic packaging in canada contain at least 50 percent of recycled content by uh, 2030 um, and these measures would strengthen uh, demand and spur investment in recycling infrastructure. And then the labeling rule uh, would prohibit the use of a uh, chasing arrow symbol unless 80% of Canada's recycling facilities accept and have re reliable end market uh, for these products and require them to be certified by a third party organization to specified standards. So these me measures would increase the supply of high quality and recyclable plastic. If I could, oh, sorry, go ahead, Faisal. No, please go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. So if there was one thing I can add in terms of a lesson learned, at least from a researcher, is that the conversation around some of these plastic bans lacks nuance with the public. The public doesn't can't readily differentiate between different product categories and classes. It's a binary yes or no, all plastics are bad, all some of these plastics are bad, or you know, they're all good. And because there's so much misinformation and nuance, they often kind of uh, have difficulty fully comprehending the breadth of the issues, which makes education and awareness particularly challenging. Um, the comment made by your colleague about kind of systemic challenges, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite catch her name, but I, I, think that's, yeah, I think that's actually the biggest challenge um, because when we're talking about, well, why does single use plastics and the proliferation of single use plastics exist to begin with? It's because of broken food systems, broken economic systems, broken consumption systems. These are not things that can be addressed at the municipal level, even the national level. It requires coordinated like shifts in kind of our, our entire way of thinking and our way of life. And I personally don't see that happening anytime soon. And so we kind of face this grappling or we're grappling with this question of what is a reasonable goal versus what is an aspirational goal. And from my perspective, I don't know which one we've landed on. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, I want to speak to what Rebecca was bringing up uh, and, and the plastic bag ban that we, we, we tried um, here not too long ago. Uh, was, and to start with the plastic bag one, um, it seemed as though we replaced the problem with a bigger problem because the bags just got thicker, which then like became more of 
a problem. They would degrade more slowly than the, the thinner bags. They would get stuck in the environment uh, like Rebecca was talking about at the top of this conversation. And I, it was very curious shift that happened. And now they're completely gone from the equation, it seems, um, because you can't, you can't get a plastic bag uh, in, in large supermarkets and, and places like that. So I, I'm curious what the lesson learned was there. Is that, well, that was just a, a big misstep is that we, we create a larger problem by trying to solve a smaller problem. Um, and the other one is we were talking about, well, you know, increasing the recyclability of the plastics and so on that we're collecting. And I think the biggest challenge going forward is how are we creating, and I, I think Mode and, and Rebecca, you've spoken to this, and I think Calvin as well, is how are we creating local plastics economies, um, which is something we've, we're so far from. You know, we've been we've been making plastics as as a um, as a I don't know as an entity on this planet for many many years for uh, at least a hundred at this point. Um, so how are we how are we tackling it locally? Because we we oftentimes and we've learned from that we put the onus on other countries mm -hmm. um, to to deal with mm -hmm. a lot of our waste, and that's. We've discovered that's very problematic and some countries have said well no we don't accept your waste so how are we creating how are we maybe scaling up projects like precious plastics and um revaluing the plastics that we're creating in creating industry and creating employment creating lots of job opportunities right here at home either in montreal or across the country um because there's so there's so much we could stop making plastic today and still have some mm -hmm. for, you know, centuries. So we, we need to, we need to figure out how to close the loop right here at home. That's a great, uh, you know, thought to cap this discussion off with. We are at one o'clock, but I did want to open up uh, to the audience and maybe final comments. Uh, if there's no questions from the panelists, if they have anything finally you'd like to say. Are there any questions from, uh, from the group? Yes. Yeah, maybe if there's a different person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, can we lend a... I love talking in a mic. Okay. Um, what's, uh, um, do you, uh, what's your uh, feelings towards the rate of return in regards to these projects? We've been doing recycling for like 10, 15 years. And from what I understood from what Mo and Rebecca said, we're recycling very little of our material. Um, and even now, some of these projects that, you know, it takes like uh, uh, tens of thousands of dollars to get the machinery, equipment, and all the pollution that's created from that process. Do we feel we're actually, yeah, is, is there a proper rate of return on our investment to actual uh, lack of, of reducing our waste without creating more? Uh, I think we've got a long way to go. <laughs> it, I can you know, take, oh, yeah, go Calvin, go, go. Oh no, I was just going to, I want to give people some context for some, some of the numbers around like, you know, investing in recycling and what does it cost? Because not all recycling is created equal. So we talked about potentially recycling um, polystyrene because there are a limited number of facilities that do it, but it costs about $2,500 a ton. And by comparison, new sprint is $80 a ton. So if we're talking about return on investment, I'm personally of the opinion that just because you can recycle something doesn't mean you should. Because when you think about the amount of dollars you spend behind an activity, that means it's dollars that you can't spend an alternative option. So I, I agree that we have to be very strategic in a resource constrained world to make sure that our dollars are going as far as they can and making as much impact as they can. Because trying to as I'm sure Maud knows, trying to recycle a plastic laminate is a fool's errand in a mechanical recycling system. And you just end up spending thousands and thousands of dollars to downcycle something in a best case scenario. Okay. 
okay, maybe any I other... can... Oh yeah, Maud, please go ahead. I can just, uh, I think it's important to know for Quebec City, uh, I th you may have under, uh, heard about the modernization of, collect of selective collection. So the change is um, actually uh, in transition for this management to the, the management of the collection and the treatment of all these matter are, is changing to the manufacturer and distributor. So um, it will have some big impact, I think, in the decisions for uh, eco-conception and uh, what uh, will be accepted in the uh, recycling bin now. So the communication will be different and the, 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 the responsibility will be very different. So I think we have also to work with this uh, context now um, and find a way to make people understand their, uh, their role in this, uh, in this new system. Wow. Um, if I could just speak um, fast. Um, um, I think we are in, in quite an issue when it comes to to how recycling happens in our country, our municipality. We talked about issues of transparency. I feel like the very reason CB3 exists and the precious plastic exists, it, it's because there is a gap um, that we are seeing. And when the waste goes to CB3, we do recycle everything. But again, we are very small scale. We are volunteers, right? We're not paid to recycle the, the waste at Concordia. And I think, I think that's very important to, to recognize, especially when we think federally, there are some municipalities that don't have any recycling and don't have any investment on anything on food and clean water. And I don't know, just your question reminds all, the, all of my frustrations with, with um, the system and with how recycling is happening here. And, um, if I could give an idea, um, in my hometown in Brazil, uh, the Precious Plastic Project is a public policy and it's given back to the community. Kids can play with the recycled plastic that, yeah, it's in parks now and it's, you know, those interrogative um, things that they put on plastics to learn. And so, yes, there is a huge gap and there is lack of transparency that is really frustrating. Um, that was all I had to say. <laughs> There. We've got a few more questions. Is there still time? I don't know. How, how are the panelists doing? Do you need to leave? Do you have a few minutes? Okay. Thumbs up. Maybe maybe two more, one more. Uh, well, we are in an educational institution and I was just curious to know, you know, how, how much, because when I talk to other consumers, there seems to be just a total lack of understanding of recycling and so many of these issues. So how much of this is awareness campaigns or educational campaigns? Um, how important does that element play in the, you know, in the pattern of this initiative? I think uh, here at, at Concordia, it was one of the big sort of reasons why we did Zero Waste Week last week and the challenge in particular was about awareness. So getting, getting our community aware of what we're trying to achieve as an institution, um, which we hope sort of, you know, leaks out into the, the surrounding communities uh, that staff, faculty, students bring what they're learning here on campus and bring that back to their own, uh, you know, neighborhoods and, and municipalities here, uh, here in the province and back home to where they might be uh, coming from. So we have a lot of international students too, and maybe they, they learn new things here and bring it back uh, to, to their home countries. Um, we're also seeing a lot of really interesting research too around waste, uh, plastic being one of them. There's some really interesting um, sort of, I don't know what the, there's a term for it, but turning plastic into fuel and things like that. So there's a lot of really interesting research happening right here at our institution. And I'm sure in institutions across the country and around the world. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see what happens next uh, in terms of the shift that we can make um, with plastics and, and waste in general, because plastic is just one part of the equation. Um, 
And I guess as a clothing thing for me, and I'll, I think there's one more question, is uh, in, in doing some research in the last few years, uh, I came upon a, an article from, uh, from Nature that, um, that said, there's now more human made mass in the world than there is left biological mass. So to give you a perspective of how much impact we've had as a species is there's more human made, mostly plastic likely on the planet than there is biological mass. So we, we got a lot of work to do. And I think if we can come together and help educate each other about the, the ways that we can reduce um, and maybe in some cases eliminate uh, the waste that we create, uh, we can hopefully be on this planet a while longer. Yeah. I mean, um, CP3 is quite big on education. It is a big part of what I do at CP3. We're now hiring, uh, we have an intern to do educational content. Um, but I think what you say is, it's still very important because again, like we work on a volunteer basis, so we don't have the range. And when we do the presentation of Plastic 101, we did it for an institution here called Apathy is Boring um, that teaches youth about democracy. And I don't know if you know, it seems like you do. <laughs> um, um, and I remember like the, the youth, I guess, that was there, they, they were just so interested and curious and they were like, I didn't even, I, I remember I, they didn't know the numbers of, of the plastic meant something. And I remember I said that I used to think it was the amount of times the plastic was recycled. <laughs> and that is not the case at all. Um, and so there is a gap in knowledge. There is a gap and this gap in knowledge takes, um, I think creates some issues of whose responsibility it is, of how, uh, and then oftentimes when we do learn about our responsibility, we take it very seriously in an individual level, but individually we were not that strong as I imagine we know. And, but we do, we do love doing educational content, but there is, I think this gap needs to be filled by um, institutions, especially institutions that people are getting paid to do these things. Great. Thank you, Marina. And we, we do have another question, but I think we're over time. I think um, if any of the panelists have any closing remarks you'd like to make before we, we close up, please feel free. Uh, Natalie has had her hand up virtually for a long time. So I just- Oh, I'm so sorry. We did not pay attention to the virtual guests. Let's get Natalie's question and then say goodbye. Thank you, Kel. Yeah. Hi there. I just wanted to thank you all for hosting this and for providing a like Zoom possibility because I'm in the Laurentians. I'm not in Montreal. Um, I work for a not-for-profit here in the Laurentians and since 2018, uh, it's called the Synergie Economique Laurentienne. Since 2018, I've been working with businesses. The, the project is called Mission Recyclage Compostage. And the biggest obstacle I see, and I'm just wondering how the panel would address this, is when I go to a business and I do a, like a diagnostic of what is their waste, uh, majority of the time there isn't even any recycling for all the juice containers and milk cartons used at the cafe and this and that. It all goes to the garbage for the simple reason that there, a lot of them are with private companies for the waste collection, and there's zero incentive for them to even get a like recycling container. I mean, it's different when it's they're um, they they're with the municipality. So I'm just wondering what you know we can do for your ideas on this because when they're with the private contracts, you know, it's just garbage, and the, it even costs more for them to get recycling or compost, so they don't do it. Um, and some of the businesses I've worked with, it's taken like three years uh, for us to get to the point where they had to like end their private contract because these contracts can last for three, five, seven years with the private companies. And they have large penalties if they want to come with a municipality. So it's a real, uh, a, a real barrier. So I just wanted to know if there were any thoughts on that. And I really appreciate hearing all your perspectives. And uh, I find it exciting uh, that I see a difference already in our area with the federal ban. Um, you know, they're they're aware 
uh, that they won't be able to use it much longer, but they have a lot of questions. And a lot of our municipalities up are following Montreal's lead and starting to implement the same type of thing. Yeah, uh, maybe I can answer this. Actually, the cities have responsible uh, responsibility for the uh, residential sector. So the terms of the service are uh, primarily adapted to this uh, customs um, for these people. Some cities will also offer, as Montreal, the service to um, the businesses, commercial, industrial, and institutional. Um, but if they uh, use it, they have to accept the mentality. So frequency, um, quantity, equipment allowed. Those are some restrictions that uh, cannot sometimes um, apply for everyone. So in this case, they have to go for private service. Mm -hmm. um, I would say uh, now we're implementing the uh, collect of organic matter. So we have a list of those uh, who we offer the service to. Um, I think it's uh, more than 50%, uh, a lot more than, I don't have the exact uh, percentage of those uh, industries that comes to the municipal service. Um, so, but it's, it's different in every city. In some others, uh, the service is not uh, offered to uh, those. Uh, these. Now, after we, we need more people to um, have uh, inspectors, on the field to see who <laughs> correctly sort and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And this is a big need uh, for cities, uh, for Montreal. Mm -hmm. Maud okay, mentioned... thank you. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say, so 50% oh. of businesses are starting to have the organics, like in restaurants no, no, and this now? We, no? I, I say we offer it to every um, institution, uh, industry and commerce. Mm -hmm. who has the service and the Montreal service mm -hmm. and it represents more than 50 percent of the this sector okay but I don't have the exact um, okay. quantity thanks we offer them and they may not take it if it doesn't apply some people have uh, don't don't have food in their industry so they don't need uh, the service so really quickly, cognizant of timing, Maud mentioned producer responsibility, and I think that's it's going to play a critical role. So the IC&I sector, the generators of the waste, the restaurant sector in this instance, they need to be on the hook for the waste that they produce, and they need to make sure that their service provider is covering a full spectrum of materials. And the whole idea of producer responsibility is that you made it, you pay for it. And I think that it's unfair to ask municipalities to carry that financial burden. And so hopefully as EPR gains additional traction, um, you'll start to see more businesses, I don't want to say forced, hopefully they embrace it willingly, um, but legislatively it will kind of push their, force their hand to start offering comprehensive waste diversion services. And I apologize for the time. No, thank you very much for those final uh, questions and responses. Really, really interesting discussion I think we had today and I'm very grateful uh, as I think our audiences as well for the uh, interesting conversation. So we just wanna thank everybody again for joining us and thank our panelists for joining us and, and sharing your knowledge. Uh, and so for those of you who are here in person, you know, feel free to stick around. We are going to announce our bingo prize winners. <laughs> Uh, and uh, we'll also just chit chat. But uh, again, thanks everybody online and have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye, thank you. Thank you.